Welcome, welcome, welcome. It looks like you've made it. The 10 day challenge finale is tonight. So congratulations, congratulations, you survived the 10 day. So this gives you a good start. Uh, hopefully you're feeling better. We didn't really do a pre and post way because we're doing everything virtual, but uh, I, you're welcome to come to the office um, and come on, to, especially if you can come up to Eustis, I have the fancy scale that tells you more than you ever wanted to know about what's going on inside of your body, but it'll give you a good idea of how much muscle you have, how much fat you have, what your bones weigh, where your muscles are, uh, right to left side, arms and legs, and where your fat is. I mean, I know you know where your fat is, but it's a good way to start so you have some documentation of where, where you need to go. So if you need to uh, be on a weight management program, then this is a good way to take a look at that from a deep, dark view. And you'll feel better on the other side, I promise. So we had a lot of physiological things that happened to our body. Um, I, you know, for me, if you did the blood sugar, if you did the inflammation, if you did the immune, really one of the top things that happens is you, you your body goes back to homeostasis and homeostasis is just the balance you know we want our blood glucose level between 70 and 110 personally you know if you, I've, I've done a workup on you for um, uh, functional medicine then you'll hear me always say i want your blood sugar under your blood glucose under 90 anything 90 and over is you know inflammatory uh, causing inflammation causing and also um, can be cancer productive so we don't want to feed the cancer so, you know, you can kind of look at this chart and this kind of shows how when we eat something, the blood glucose will rise. Then the beta cells <clears throat> of the pancreas are released and they release insulin. And then the liver takes up the glucose and starts to build glycogen. And then the blood cells um, are, are take up the rest of the glucose. Then the blood glucose levels fall and they return back to the homeostasis. But if the blood glucose levels drop, then the alpha cells of the pancreas release glucagon. They then inform the liver, hey, you need to break down the glycogen that you had earlier and release it as glucose into the cells. And then the blood glu glucose will rise back to a normal level. So that's how it should work. We are the ones that mess that up, in case you didn't know. So last week I talked a, a lot about the innate uh, immune system. I think it's important you know that, but I want to talk about inflammation and what, you know, the role it plays in your health and how we use whole foods and herbal solutions to help that. And remember, inflammation is, is a, a big part of, you know, uh, the immune system as well. And you, you saw last week that the inflammation is one of the ways the body deals with any incoming pathogens or uh, invaders into the body. So it's a system that is designed to help us, but sometimes it goes awry. So the CDC, uh, this is right from their website. This is the, the what they call new evidence that indicates that uncontrolled inflammation is a prominent component of many diseases, including well-known inflama inflammatory diseases such as arthritis, periodontal disease, inflammatory disease, bowel disease, cardiovascular disease, neurogenitive diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, asthma, cancer, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and autoimmune diseases. And it's in epidemic proportions. Each Peripheral blood marker of inflammation are either present and elevated, and aging and pro-inflammatory nutrition also contribute to increases in inflammatory markers. And you know we can't help getting older, but we can age healthy, and we can you know have longevity to our life. My goal is not to sit in a wheelchair drooling on myself. I want to be riding my bike when I'm 90 years old. So we can do that by the foods that we eat and the exercise that we do and the rest that we get. So the impact of uncontrolled inflammation on the U.S. alone is estimated in the hundreds of millions of dollars for each disease, for each disease, and with a substantial increase by 2030. That's just 10 years away. So I, I know this is, looks a little geeky here, but I'm just going to give you a little brief explanation. So when we have inflammation, that so say you... Um, have a swollen joint, you hit your hand, or you have some arthritis, that inflammation then is perceived and is sent to the dorsal root ganglion. This is an area that lies in the either side of your spine where the, the spinal nerve root is, and it travels up and down the spine. So when the dorsal root ganglion gets that information, it's a sensory, uh, it gets sensory information from the spinal cord, 
uh, gives it to the spinal cord. And then spinal cord releases what we call substance P. And that travels up a couple different levels and goes to the nervous, central nervous system and says, okay, hey, you need to re release prostaglandin. And that will induce a fever or suppress T helper cells. And that signals the inflammation. So those are things that we, we can actually manage. And I'm going to show you how. But I think you really need to understand the process because, you know, a lot of my, a lot of Dr. Cooper and my patients come in all the time, just, you know, all flamed up and we have a, a variety of reasons that happens. We have environmental reasons like allergens and toxins and nobody here is stressed, uh, infection, trauma, lowered oxygen, uh, drugs, alcohol. Then, then we have genetic component, the, the polymorphisms, which render uh, each individual with different susceptibilities. So my susceptibilities may be different than somebody else's because we have different parents. Diet, the macronutrients. You hear me talk about macronutrients. That's your carbohydrates, your proteins, your lipids, your fats. Uh, your micronutrients are what those all break down into and into your vitamins uh, your, and your accessory nutrients and your phytonutrients. And then you have function. It's sh the shift of physiological state into alarm is what characterizes the is characterized by that inflammatory process. And then we have symptoms of inflammation. So that's when a, when osis becomes itis with increasing severity. And uh, Dr. Cooper and I we may ask you, we may touch on your shoulder or your neck and say, oh, what's your husband's name or what's your wife's name? Oh, Bob? Well, we'll call this some Bob itis that's hanging out up in here. We're just joking, of course. So we have roots of chronic inflammation. So we have genetic susceptibility triggers. We have overabundance of inflammatory precursors. That's high A um, uh, arachidonic acid or glycating diet. Um, so that would be your uh, trans fats, your sugars and things like that, uh, that, you, that, that the body um, gets too much of. Lack of antioxidant phytochemicals. And it means not eating enough real food. Um, insufficient dampening or excessive upregulation of endogenous mediators, and then malfunctioning off switch. So we have a, a switch that's designed to go off, but sometimes it's not working because of we're not eating the right foods, we're not getting enough rest, we're too stressed. Um, so we have inadequate priming of the T reg, reg cells and uh, imbalance of the uh, T1, T2 lymphocytes. And when it says TH1, we're talking about the thymex, uh, sorry, the thymus. So this is, you know, we talked about a cytokine storm. This is kind of what happens. We have all these things that come in, the bacteria, oxidative stress, viruses, physical stress, DNA damage, and it, it goes into something we call nuclear factor um, kappa, B, kappa B, and then it releases its own cytokines, chemokines, antioxidants, apoptosis. Remember, that's the cell death. It regulates that, growth factors, cell control, and immune receptors. So all those trigger, that whole storm will trigger all these things to happen. Sometimes the storm is just overwhelming. So when we look at uh, causes of chronic inflammation, I mean, it, it just goes without saying, you know, obesity, visceral fat, and the visceral fat is really important. It is a big, it's a big um, disease maker. And that's our belly fat. And that's the, the big thing that I like to manage. And the scale that we have in Eustace that I call the truth slayer measures, actually measures visceral fat. That's why the, the machine is so expensive. But it measures that visceral fat and it lets you know where you are. So I think it's really important that everybody knows where their visceral fat is. Because that, that really is your destiny for your, for your disease. So the lower, the better. Um, I like to see it under 10, and I like to see it around four or five. And most of you, if you would do that, you'd be really shocked at how, how high that is. Uh, environmental pollutants, uh, cardiovascular disease, oxidative stress, nutrient excess, nutrient deficiencies, dysbiosis, which just means you know, gut problems, um, food sensitivities. All these things are causes of chronic inflammation when they get out of hand. So we talk about, you hear me always saying, you hear them on the news talking about comorbidities between uh, and for the COVID disease, uh, excuse me, the COVID virus. The comorbidities means that, you know, if you have, if you're uh, obese or overweight, if you're diabetic, if you're hypertensive, if you have any other, if you smoke, I mean, and if you're smoking, stop. But if you have any of those um, other uh, diseases, 
you're going to be more susceptible to the, the effects of the COVID virus. So, and you can see with this graph, I know it's a little bit small, but you can see, you know, just looking at rheumatoid arthritis, how it connects with cardiovascular disease, and then it connects with Alzheimer's dementia and dementia. So, I mean, they all, you know, with the psoriasis, peridental, scleroderma, ankylosing spondylitis, COPD, all these multiple chemical sensitivities, all those go together. So it's really quite amazing how they interlock. So it, it's, it's, this is why it's such a problem. So we have kind of decision pathways built in for acute inflammation. And I mean, this is done for us without us thinking about it again, but the foods that we eat or don't eat or the exercise that we get or don't get, uh, the fresh air that we do breathe or don't breathe, are all going to make a difference on how our body manages this inflammation. So it can either be chronic or resolution. So what's the ideal outcome? Obviously, we want resolution. So say you have a boo-boo and uh, you have these invading organisms coming in and it's trying to start an infection. So we have chemical mediators that come in that kind of protect us. So we call that acute inflammation. So then we have a, a, a passive process that self-limits that and we call that resolution. But if that acute inflammation carries on, then that goes into a chronic inflammation. It can be something like periodontal disease or rheumatoid arthritis, uh, formation of an abscess, uh, wound healing, scarring, organ fibrosis. So that, that's like a, the chronic area we don't want to see. We want that passive process, which is well designed in our body. Like I said, we just don't do the right thing sometimes to promote that. So we have cardinal signs of inflammation. And their heat, redness, swelling, pain, and loss of function. I like the little guys here. But this, this is the process the body goes through. And, you know, think about when we have a, a virus that comes in, we get heat. We, our body um, temperature rises to kill the virus. And then we have redness. If you have a cut, you have the same heat transformation, but you may get redness at the area and swelling. And, you know, if you're sick, you get swelling in your lymph glands. Uh, and you may have pain associated with that. And then, you know, if it was a, a cut or, you know, a trauma to a, a body part, you may have loss of function of that body part as well. So when we have tissue injury, um, it's caused by a physical and chemical agent or a pathogen microorganism. It, it still works the same way. You have capillary widening, which increases the blood flow. There's where your heat comes in. You have increased permeability. That fluid gets released into the tissues. That's where your redness and swelling comes in. You have an attraction of leukocytes, your white blood cells, and then you have an extravasation of the leukocytes to the site of the injury, which is where your ten tenderness comes in. Then you have a systemic response, which would be fever and proliferate, pro proliferation of leuc leukocytes, which uh, would be where the pain would come in. So we, we, as doctors, we talk about that there's a, a new clinical paradigm of inflammation. There are two key phases that resolve the process and balance the immune modulation. So, I mean, whether it's a cut or a viral, you know, load coming in, a pathogen, still works the same way. So you'll have a lot of uh, phagocytic traffic activity, um, and then the time from the acute response, you get the edema, and the neutrophils come in, leukocytes, macrophages, and you have resolution. Or sorry, uh, just the neutrophils come in, you have resolution. If it hasn't resolved yet and needs a little help, that's when the, the monocytes and the macrophages come in, and then that creates also resolution. So you kind of have two, you resolve, and then you balance and get back to uh, a normal, a normal uh, balanced immune modulation. And I know these are all kind of geeky. I'm not trying to make you crazy, but uh, when we talk about resolvents, I just want you to know that's the metabolic byproduct of omega-3 fatty acids. That's why omega-3 fatty acids are so key in helping with inflammation. So those resolvents interact with that system cell receptor, and it activates that uh, morphogenic material leading to a, a pathway of resolution of that inflammation. So it's super important to get your omega-3s, and if I haven't said that enough already. And in just your general health, and I'll talk about that at the end, but a good fish oil, and if you're burping the fish oil, it's because it's rancid or you have some type of digestive issue. So make sure you're not going to Costco and buying the, you know, uh, buck 780 barrel of fish oil because you will burp that. So get some good quality fish oil. A trace mineral B B12 because there are minerals that we need. We don't need a lot of them. That's why we call them trace. But some of the foods we get, they're just not in there anymore. I mean, 
there were not grown in soils that were rich in nutrients. So we need to uh, supplement with that. And then a really good high quality multi. And, that, that, and even though I eat very well, there's, I can't eat enough food to support the activity that my body does or the, the, for my demands of my physical training. So I do supplement a lot. And if you're ever in the office and you want to see, I will be glad to show you just one portion of what I take in a day. Um, and I do, it, uh, I do a lot of things that are proactive as well because I think I don't want to go down the road and say, oh, man, I wish I would have taken more turmeric. I may have, may have had less inflammation. Or there's a lot of things that I know for longevity purposes that I use, like um, cellular, uh, um, can't think of the name all of a sudden, cellular, it's there, Vitanox, Herbivital, those things, OPC Synergy. Um, I use a lot of those things for be, to be proactive and not reactive. And you hear me talk about that. When you come in and you're hurting, you're reacting to the pain and that's why you're in. But if you're coming in for a maintenance tune up to get an adjustment, you're being proactive. So you don't have a problem. I prefer proactivity than reactivity. I mean, there's accidents and we understand that, but you know, if something's been bothering you for six or eight weeks and it's not getting any better, it's still not going to get any better. It's like when your car makes that noise, that car is not going to heal overnight. So when we talk about inflammation support compounds, turmeric, uh, just a number one, bromelain, polyphenols, that's what you get from red wine uh, or grapes, uh, black currant seed oil, your EGCG, that is actually from green tea, uh, ginger, your essential fatty acids, and your, your special uh, specialized, uh, they're kind of a, uh, pain mod um, uh, modifiers. So we also have something now that we call oxflammation. And that's actually a pre-pathological condition, and it's very well documented, but it's from chronic and systemic oxidative stress associated uh, with a, like a vicious cycle from a mild subclinical to a chronic inflammation. And that's an occurrence of a long-term sustained oxidative stress. And that contributes to a general, generate, has a tendency to generate a permanent loss of capacity to react to that adaptive homeostatic response that we all should have that stabilizes and uh, helps us, but it doesn't, it keeps us more in a pro-inflammatory uh, status than not. So when we'll talk about oxidative stress, when we, when we talk about that, we have what we call reactive oxygen ni nitrogen species. And so what happens is we have an injury uh, we have an, a pro-inflammatory factors that come in, you know, and that's what helps the body say, okay, you have to do this to resolve that. So we have increasing expression of the cytokines. That's that cytokine storm we talked about. Then we have the leukocytes, the white blood cells come in, all the body doing it, the vasodilation, the activ activation of the phagocytic cells, elimination of dead cells and tissue. And then normally I should just go over to elimination of inflammatory trigger, proliferation of this, the vascular capillaries. So we have a, a, a reverse of the blood flow, flow so we don't have the uh, a huge blood flow that causes the, the heat and the redness. We get repair of the damage, and then we have an expression of the anti-inflammatory cytokines. And then we have resolution of that inflammation. But what happens now is we have that reactive oxygen uh, nitrogen species and that causes a dysfunction in that feedback loop. So we have uh, a dysfunction of the feedback regulation of the inflammatory response, and it escapes from resolution, and that'll just go on to be those chronic degenerative diseases, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, cancer. And then it goes over to a kind of a chronic persistence of the stimulus of that at a subclinical level, which that causes um, or, or brings up like inherited diseases like uh, Down, Down syndrome, Rett syndrome, sickle cell anemia. And that just becomes a, a loop. So we call that oxflammation. Oxflammation is from oxidative stress. So inflammation is, as com is a common feature of, of dysfunction and disease. So, you know, the main cells involved in inflammation that we talked about last time were the neutrophils, macrophages, and other immune cells. Um, we have controlled chemical mediators, and we have what are called, which are called the cytokines and the chemical chemokines. So inflammation is a very rapid, intense response. It's aimed to protect the tissue and uh, create recovery, promptly control any of the detrimental consequences from arising from an over-response. But when the tissue offense is removed, the infection has been cleared, the damaged tissue repaired, we have what we call an inflammation re resolution. 
if that inflammation is switched off when the feedback mechanism triggers the expression of the anti-inflammatory molecules, then the trigger activates an acute inflammatory response. And so the resolution phase is not efficient, and then, then a chronic inflammatory state may occur. So that chronic inflammation is localized and somehow confined to the site of the original inflammatory inducer. So we have some non-heritable uh, uh, met metabolic diseases. So obesity and obesity-associated metabolic syndrome have a very significant play in an in inflammatory component. Uh, chronic inflammation can promote obesity-associated diabetes by actually inducing insulin resistance. And when we're talking about being diabetic, that's what's happening. Our, our body can't process. We eat so much sugar, it can't, you know, the pancreas can't push the glucose into the liver and into the cells like it should, so we become resistant. The insulin can't do its job anymore. That's Then they put a patient on metformin or some other medication. Remember, type 2 diabetes is 99% of the time caused by us. We can fix it. If we cause it, we can fix it. But that's making some dietary changes. Obesity-associated inflammation is, is first triggered by excess nutrients that allow allow it to activate uh, metabolic signaling pathways. So eating a lot of sugar or uh, refined carbohydrates will cause that whole signaling path, it, path to be um, activated. When these pathways uh, initiate and sustain obesity-associated inflammation, it's initially confined in the white adipose tissue, and then it spreads to the other organs, the liver, the pancreas, and the brain. So it affects the immune cell infiltration and polarizations toward the adipose tissue. So it makes the body attack the fat, so to speak. Now, this is another one. I know it's a lot, but I just the, the re reason I want you to do the, see this is that uh, we want, we want re a reduction, of, reduction to homeostasis. So that's kind of the chemical pathway that that happens. Um, the sulfur oxidase dimutase and the hydrogen peroxide, the glutathione peroxidase, water, then it becomes maintenance of that uh, redox, the reduction of that concentration in the cell. Why I tell you that is the foods that we eat that are rich in that SOD, that dimutase, is our broccoli and cabbage and barley grass. And those are a lot of the products that, uh, that's the beauty of standard process. They have that in there. Um, there are also good sources of minerals, of zinc, copper, manganese, that's your trace minerals. And then our bodies use these to make our own SOD. And then sulfur is actually required for the synthesis of glutathione. And foods rich in glutathione are really der derived from pro dietary proteins, such as beef, fish, and poultry. There are some vegan sources, um, like uh, cruciferous vegetables, like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, kale, and watercress, and mus mustard greens. Some of these are foods we eat, and some of them they're not. If you're not going to eat them, I'm going to put them in a pill and make you take them. So then allium vegetables, which are your garlic and your shallots and your uh, onions, also boost, boost up that glutathione. So you can see how the glutathione is very important and, and remain kind of keeping the, the very delicate balance in the, uh, inside the cell. So uh, diabetes mellitus type 2, uh, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, they're all related to oxidative stress. Uh, we have uh, hyper, the primary triggers of tissue damage are due to hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, uh, the uh, advanced glycated uh, products that happen like eating too much sugar, uh, their typical complications are, of diabetes are polyneuropathy, retinopathy, and atherosclerosis. In cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis is widely referred to a chronic, as a chronic inflammatory pathology. And you can see how when that metabolic syndrome that you hear people talk about, they're, when they're diabetic or they're obese, you know, they're obese, they get type 2 diabetes, which then turns into cardiovascular disease and then can have a systemic manifestation, manifestation which would be Alzheimer's. So, you know, we have a lot of uh, neurodegeneration that happens from these uh, diseases. So that's a couple of the risk factors for that. So. In particular, when I like when I do a functional medicine panel on you, I always ask for uh, high sensitive CRP, which is high sensitive C-reactive protein. All three of those are have increased um, CRP markers, and that's associated with an increased risk. Now, if there if your cholesterol is good and your blood sugar is good, 
uh, especially cholesterol, I, I don't worry, you know, sometimes I'll worry that if the, the those markers are really high or off, I worry about, uh, I look at CR, high CRP for stroke or heart attack. But if all those are in a normal range, I'm looking at CRP more for inflammation. And it's one of the most clinically and uh, validating markers that we use for systemic inflammation. So, and that's, you know, that's what a heart attack is. It's systemic inflammation. That's what a stroke is. It's because we eat too much sugar and it damages our, our, our arteries and our uh, vascular system. So elevated levels of CRP, um, its principal downstream inducer is uh, IL-6. You don't need to know that. But the thing that I want you to know, it actually causes CNS disorder. CNS disorders, which are central nervous system disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. So how do we get past all that? We eat, like, we eat right, so an alkaline diet. So you're gonna focus on your whole foods, your colorful fruits and berries, veggies, nuts and seeds, and even a little dark chocolate. Um, I'm not talking about the dark chocolate um, Three Musketeer bar or something like that. I'm talking a real dark chocolate, the 60 or 70% cacao. Uh, so we want to increase your intake of those antioxidant foods as well as fat soluble vitamins and important minerals. And you may not be getting all of them. And if you're making a lifestyle change, that's why we give you something like Catalan because it gives you everything you need for your body to do the work. I use the shake method when I take my Catalan in the morning. And so what I do is I open the bottle and I, however many I shake out into my hand, that is how many I take. So you want to eliminate foods that encourage inflammation, like uh, foods that are high in sugar, which is a no-brainer, highly processed foods, reduce your alcohol intake. Um, exercise. Exercise has been shown to lower the CRP and strengthen bone at the same time. Pressure on bone builds bone. So my women, as we age over 50 and we start losing estrogen, get out there and do weight-bearing exercises. If you're walking, that's great, but you have to do something for your upper body, unless you're walking on your hands, of course. Mindful exercise like Tai Chi and yoga are especially helpful for, you know, if you're just beginning. And rest. Insufficient sleep has been shown to, de to increase inflammation and CRP levels, so please make sleep a priority. So four ways to lower the, your C-reactive protein is eat a, you know, a, a whole food-based diet, eliminate foods that cause inflammation, exercise, and rest. That's, it's not hard to do. So we want to increase the high antioxidant foods, and these are the ones that, re, you know, we talked about oxidative stress. This is why we eat antioxidant foods. Dark chocolate, pecans, blueberries, strawberries, artichokes, goji berries, raspberries, kale, red cabbage, pinto beans, beets, spinach, red wine. I didn't put that on the list, but it's on there. So inflammation is really good for you. It's an important action. It's, it's triggered by the immune system and it's in response to injury or a, you know, a pathogen coming in. And there are two phases of initiation, uh, sorry, yeah, initiation and resolution. And resolution is the same thing as repair. And that's the complete cycle. A body likes to stay in balance. And when the body's in balance, the resolution phase resolves the inflam the, that inflammatory cascade and brings the body back to homeostasis. But chronic inflammation is bad for you. And when that resolution phase is inadequate and inflammation becomes chronic, it triggers that oxidative stress. That's why it's important to eat the antioxidant foods. Oxidative stress and chronic inflammation are the mechanisms that unify the pathology of almost all disease states. Traditionally, medicines have targeted the initiation phase by seeking to block the effects. So that's like uh, if you're driving your car and you're losing a drop of oil a day, the gauges in the car look perfectly normal till you lose that one more drop of oil and then your oil pressure light comes on in the car. We call those what dummy lights or idiot lights. They're indicator lights is what they're called. They're indicating there's a problem. Well, if you're taking a pain medication, that's just like putting a piece of tape over it. It's not really fixing the problem. It's just taking away the symptom. So there, we have three general phases associated with experience of pain. We have nociception, pain perception, and the consequences of pain, like suffering and behaviors motivated by pain, like being grumpy when we don't feel good. So what's a nociceptor? It's a, the little sensory neuron that it does the initial um, call saying, hey, we've got some damaging, you know, uh, sub, something happening here. Either we, we stepped on a nail or we have bacteria coming into the area. 
Um, that injury-related stimuli then changes the temperature and pressure, and we have the swelling and the redness and that whole infl inflammation cascade that we talked about earlier. And then opioids, I mean, you know, it, it's such an overwhelming, it's an epidemic. I mean, it, it's, it's even worse than um, the epidemic of the COVID right now. So what happened is, you know, people, especially my, my senior patients, I should be careful with that because I'm getting near that senior age, but um, I, I hear patients and they're like, well, the doctor told me to take one every four hours and then they take the whole bottle. If you don't hurt, you don't need to take it. It's not, not fixing anything. It's only blocking. And, and honestly, Oxycontin and Percocet, they don't really take the pain away. They just don't make, they make you not care. So uh, your own immune cells produce opiates. Most people don't even know that. And they, that's what, you know, which act on an opioid receptor in the body. And the problem with opioid painkillers is they prevent the noce nociceptor activity and they provide the pain, leave, pain relief, but here's the danger. In your brain stem, you have a mechanism that tells your uh, heart to beat and for you to breathe. The problem with opioids is when somebody takes too much, either they take too many, you know, they overdose on them or even just are chronically taking them. In the night, it just tells them, okay, don't breathe, don't heartbeat, and they, they die. So that's why, and, and, and personally, and you know, I've had many injuries. I've taken these medications only once because I get very, uh, I get really, really bad vertigo and I get very nauseous. And to me being, and it doesn't really do much for the pain. So I have a hard time seeing how people get highly addicted to them uh, because they just make me want to throw up and you know, I have to keep my foot on the floor when I'm in the bed. So I generally don't take them. So then we have non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, they're a little less dangerous, but they do, you know, they do cause a lot of uh, silent bleeding in the um, intestines and like a leave, and which is naproxen. First thing it does is it goes into your, um, your stomach and eats a hole in it. So we have that silent bleeding, hap bleeding happening there, which damages the whole uh, system for our digestion. And you can go look these up. This is drugs.com, the side effects of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. That's huge. And, and this is especially people that are chronically taking them. I mean, I have, I have some of my friends who are athletes and they're like, yeah, I took two ibuprofen before I rode today. Well, how smart is that? I mean, they, your body's designed to say, hey, you got a problem here. You might want to back off a little bit. You don't take the medication so you can do more and hurt yourself. So we have pain perception, and that's the experience of feeling the pain and the uh, detection of painful stimuli, and it's controlled by the pain receptors. And some people have, you know, a higher tolerance of pain than others. Uh, we have tests to do that. I mean, I can always tell when I'm treating a patient who is a little bit more sensitive than not by just doing one little test. And if, they, if I do that test and they react pretty uh, rapidly or um, overwhelmingly, then I know that they're very sensitive to pain. If I do that test and they don't really react, I know that they have a very high threshold of pain. So we have a variety, you know, when people are getting sent to pain management, there, there's a variety of strategies, so, you know, over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, your opioids, corticosteroids, antihistamines. But the body's signaling system, you know, it, it wants to, it always wants to be in resolution. So injuries that result in inflammatory mediators being released from the damaged cells, if you're just putting a piece of tape over it, if you're just blocking the the pain receptor, that doesn't, that's that's actually ruining the whole way the body uh, reacts and 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 to do its job. So those inflammatory mediators are designed to you know, react to the inflammation in the cell, release more chemicals in the body and activate a pain response for a reason. So if you put your hand on the hot stove, it's the signal that tells you to pull your hand off because it's going to burn or you got burned instead of just leaving the hand on there going, oh yeah, it's hot. It's really, really hot. So we have those signals. It's a defense mechanism, natural defense system. So those, so we actually have a system in our, our body called the endocannabinoid system. I have a two-hour lecture I could share with you, um, but the endocannabinoid system is just like your endocrine system, your vascular system, your 
uh, digestive system, your reproductive system, your respiratory system. And it's a system that, that they really didn't discover we had until about uh, in the mid 1970s. And we have two types of receptors in, in the body. We have a, a CB1 receptor and a CB2 receptor. The CB1 receptor is expressed in, in neuronal cells, and that neuronal, when we hear that word, you automatically think of brain. And the CB2 receptors are expressed on immune cells. So if you're taking an endocannabinoid receptor, so taking endocannabinoid receptor agonist, either topically or systemically, also inhibits that nociception, that pain, pain perception. And that we do that with a standard process as hemp oil, and now we have a liquid uh, hemp complex that you can put in your mouth but that's really key and really um, just kind of calming those receptors as they when they start uh, reacting to the pain so the immune system the thymus gland that's where your T helper cells are actually made we actually have a CB2 cannab cannabinoid receptor there and in the brain we have a CB1 cannabinoid receptor as well and it's kind of a reverse synapse you don't need to know how all that works I know way too much about it, but this is how, like, so if you're just taking, if uh, a patient is using medical marijuana or they're using just CBD, it will only affect the CB1 receptor and the cannabinoid in the receptor in the brain. If you're taking hemp, which is where CBD comes from, but hemp is the whole product, that's what binds to the CB2 receptor and is more um, effective. So you don't get the you know, psychotic uh, effect of the um, medical marijuana because the psychoactive, there's no THC in it. I mean, I think in the hemp, there's like 0.003% of THC in there. So you're not really going to notice any, um, you know, effect from that. And there, as you can see, the receptors are all out through, all throughout the body. And we're even finding that there's a, a areas of trauma have what we call a CB3 receptor. Um, they are just now discovering that, so there's a lot of information out on it. It's extremely mind-blowing. So these are all the signs of if, that you have inflammation. I mean, I can just glance and I can see five or six of them that, that fit in my, my, my ballpark. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So we want to minimize those things. So we have modifiable risk factors for inflammation. Our environment where we live, and, and at least in Florida, we've got a nice clean environment. So we're not breathing a lot of stuff in unless you are chasing the um, mosquito spray guy around on your bicycle, which I do not do anymore, I promise. Um, age is a, a factor because the older we get, the better we were, and we probably eat less food and we're less active and you know, our body can't react as quickly because we haven't fed it well enough. It, it, it has all the capability. We just think, oh, we're old and we just don't do stuff anymore. Obesity is a huge factor. Uh, foods that are high in carbohydrates or pro high processed um, uh, refined sugars or, or flours, uh, polyunsaturated vegetable oils like canola oil, vegetable oil, all those trans fats, anything that, you know, you shouldn't eat anything that's not expeller pressed and organic, like uh, extra virgin olive oil. Um, you can do sunflower oil. We have macadamia nut oil. We have uh, avocado oil here at the house. So allergens and sensitivities can also be factors of inflammation. Um, casein, which is in milk, uh, gluten, trans fats, uh, environmental cleaning products. Now, I know that in the office, we always clean the tables and we always have cleaned the tables and we've always washed our hands, but we've, we clean even more now because uh, of the current environment of COVID-19. It's just our new normal. Uh, plastic adhesives, air quality, um, BPA and, and plastic in cans. Stress is another one. It increases uh, the release of cortisol, that, which then increases the insulin. And then hormones, the change in hormones, uh, andropause and menopause. Andropause, of course, for men, which I think is kind of funny because it's andropause for men and menopause for women. I don't get that. I know it, I know why it's that way, but it just doesn't make sense. So I want you really to work on an anti-inflammatory diet. Fresh is best. Vegetables and fruit. Remember my two-to-one ratio. All colors of the rainbow. Your omega-3 fatty acids. Whole grains I'd be careful with, especially wheat and corn. Those two have to be pollinated, and they're most likely to have the most inflammatory um, effect. 
ginger and curry or turmeric are great for anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, white, green, and oolong teas, red wine has great antioxidant activity. Uh, just avoid your refined and processed foods and no trans fats. What can we do with nutrition? So that's why you're doing the 10 day um, inflammation program or the blood sugar or the immune. All those things help with our inflammation. Uh, the omega-3 should be increased. You can use the hemp oil complex. If you're, not, if you're not sure if you're a candidate for that, please ask either Dr. Cooper or I or talk to Tina or Marianne. Um, I, it, it's, it's an amazing uh, product that they came out with. And the, the beauty of the hemp oil is that they get it from Poland and it actually comes from an organic farm in Poland where, and then they run it through a gas spectrometer. So they make sure they have exactly what they're asking for and what they're purchasing. Uh, they have a hard time finding it in the United States because most everything now, uh, as far as hemp is genetically modified. So, you know, because there's a great need for it. So turmeric and forte, turmeric forte and boswellia complex. Um, if I'm going to say one or the other, I'm going to always go turmeric forte. I mean, it's a slam dunk. They process it with fenugreek seed, which keeps it uh, more bioavailable in your system. So one or two tablets make it through the whole day. If you're taking like turmeric powder, you're putting it in your shake, or you're doing um, like a turmeric root, or you're taking over-the-counter turmeric, most of the time what happens is that you uh, it's bioavailable for about an hour and you lose half. So if you take 500 milligrams of turmeric over the counter, in an hour you only have 125 milligrams available. And then another hour you have 75 milligrams. And it just keeps dwindling within a three or four hour, it's not there. So you're having to take it all the time. Where the turmeric forte is a, a fabulous um, product that Medier put out that is just brilliant. And, you know, tag team that with some omega threes, the fish oils, and it's, you know, knock it out of the ballpark winner. Uh, protomorphogens, and, you know, I, I didn't really go into protomorphogens, that may be a, for another day, um, and herbs. So look at all these herbs that, that influence your um, inflammation. Stephania root, that, that helps to reduce the inflammatory cytokine, the uh, uh, IL-6. Um, stinging nettle helps balance the COX-2 inhibitors. Um, holy basil decreases the lipopolysaccharides, helps balance the release of those cytokines. Ginger root decreases lipooxygenase activity. And that, uh, when we're talking oxy, we're talking about oxidative stress to the body, as well as macrophage and neutrophil activation. Uh, Indian frankincense, which is boswellia, um, balances everything, uh, activates protein, and the uh, tumor, um, uh, tumor fact, um, tumor, tumor neutralizing factor um, alpha, <clears throat> and then green tea. Uh, balances the inflammatory cytokines and lutein. Um, it also balances that if the nuclear factor uh, alpha B or kappa, kappa B. So we didn't do a pre and post way, but I know most of you weighed. And just remember that we have non-scale victories. You know, your clothes are fitting better, more energy, improved endurance, better sleep, fewer cravings, feel healthier. And that's where the truth slayer scale in Eustace is very valuable because I'll have patients coming in and you can reference Tina. She will tell you exactly what happened to her. I mean, she thought, oh, I haven't lost any weight. But when she got to see, she did lose weight, but she put on muscle and lost body fat and her visceral fat went down. So that's a huge win. <clears throat> And just remember the scale, <clears throat> it measures all of your body weight, not just your fat. You know, it doesn't tell you how, what a great person you are or how much your fans, friends and family love you and that you're kind, smart, and funny and that you have self-worth. So in that case, I just fixed the scale for you. No worries. But please, please, I, I invite you to come up to Eustace. You can make your appointment with either Tina or Marianne. Um, it's worth the drive. You have to get your passport out to get over 494, uh, 414, and, but you'll enjoy the experience. So we do all this because I, I also want to factor, you know, influence the, the factors of uh, human aging and longevity. You know, we don't, we work so hard to get in our fifties and sixties. I want to enjoy it. 
and I'm, I'm doing so. I mean, I have friends that are the same age and it's like a little scary when I look at them, I'm like, you can't even get up out of the chair or if we went canoeing or kayaking, it, it's ridiculous. They, my friends that are the same age can't get in and out of a boat. So these are some of the factors. We have intrinsic factors or genetic factors. We have epigenetic factors, which integrate with the intrinsic factors and external effects. We have environment, we have diet and lifestyle and diet and lifestyles are all very changeable. So to have a healthy diet and a lifestyle factors that create longevity, your physical activity needs to be at least three and a half hours a week. That's 30 minutes a day. That's nothing out of a 24 hour day. No smoking. Uh, you can have some alcohol, but just keep it moderate. Alternative, alternative health eating index is the top 40% that makes a, a change in all those, the diet and the lifestyle and longevity. And a body mass index, which we've calculated for you before with the handheld, but the Truth Slayer will also calculate it uh, very accurately. And it's, 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 it's unfortunate because I have patients when I tell them that their body mass index is 30, which puts them in the obese category, they're like, well, I'm not fat. This is what the measurement tells us. This is why we have the measurements and we're, to, we're measuring a lot of the visceral fat that way. So doing these things, if you do all five of those things, it will increase your life expectancy. And you know, that means you're gonna age healthy. And that means you'll be able to do stuff and play with the grandkids and, and ride your bike a lot of miles or uh, take those trips you saved your money to do, you know, when you were working and now you're retired. So it even helps to reduce chronic disease. And these are all potentially, um, you know, deadly diseases. And it, it really decreases them like 50 and 60% for cancer and stroke is 30 and 40%. And uh, for uh, uh, chronic heart disease, or you know, it's you know, 80, 70 and 60 and 70 and 80 percent diabetes, it's 80 and 90 percent reduction, just by adopting that low risk lifestyle. It's not hard to do. So for post program, so here's what you want to think about. You've worked really hard to get where you are. You've taken your supplements. You've increased your exercise. Now we want to continue that journey, and we want to kind of create our new normal in this new normal world that we're in. So if you're going to add some foods in, so you can still eat this very similar way. I, I really don't change my eating much. I just kind of throw cheese out for, for the 10 days. That's probably the only thing that I don't, you know, normally, I mean, I have in my normal diet. Um, quinoa, sprouted grains, wild rice, remember wild rice is a seed, quinoa is a seed. Um, you can have a half a cup to a cup, but limit it to a couple times a week. Fruit, two to three servings per day in your shakes or as a snack, but remember, be smart. Select your, your blueberries or strawberries um, instead of your bananas. Um, add some cottage cheese in, maybe some imported white cheese, honey and Greek yogurt, one to two servings a day. So uh, I, my white cheese story is that, you know, what color is milk? Milk is white, what color should cheese be then? White, not orange. I don't know where orange milk comes from. So I want you to use the good fats. I mean, regularly, I want you to use avocado oil, any kind of nut oil, coconut oil, olive oil. I've never used tiger nut oil. And you can even use rendered animal fat, which is the other name for lard. Um, occasionally, some of the sunflowers and the ghee and the butters, uh, the grapeseed and the sesame oils, um, just make sure your, your butter is grass-fed. Not the butter's not grass-fed, but the cow that produced the milk that produced the butter is grass-fed. Um, and you definitely want to, if you have canola, vegetable oil, corn oil, soybean oil, margarine in your house, just get rid of it now. If the bottle's not open, I mean, I can't even tell you to donate that to a food bank. It's just, to me, it's not ethically correct. So maybe use it as a weed killer and recycle the bottle. Um, so sleep tips, uh, prayer and meditation, a clean diet, early morning sunlight. There is a lot of uh, uh, literature out there about getting the first 15 minutes of sunlight on your face. And before you get, when you first get up and before you go to bed, before the sun goes down, write a journal about your day. Don't work where you sleep. No electronics two hours before bed and maybe try some sound therapy. And supplementally, you know, I, I have patients using some, you know, really high flutin, you know, prescription medications to sleep, but it's, it's not inducing a natural sleep. Uh, it's kind of a fake sleep. 
And so then you can't, you feel drugged the next day. But something like Mintran, which is a, what we call a mineral tranquilizer, or Mintex, magnesium, Cava Forte, which is what we use instead of uh, Xanax, uh, Valerian Complex, all are great supplements for, uh, to help for, to get some good sleep. And exercise, strength, cardio, and flexibility. Remember we talked about cardio as paying your credit card off. You have to do it every month, have to do it every month. Your strength is paying your mortgage off. Once you pay the mortgage off, you just maintain. And your sweeteners, I want you to buy, avoid those, the, the, the green, pink, yellow um, packets, blue packets, uh, processed sugar. Um, you can use some honey, a little bit of honey, maple syrup, monk fruit is really, um, it comes in a powder, stevia. Any of your sugar alcohols are fine to use, but um, be careful with those because sometimes they can uh, cause a little gastric disturbance, maybe a little diarrhea. So. This is some of the supplementation I, we talked about earlier, but I would recommend like um, three tablets of Catalan. Uh, remember, that's when I do a shake method. So however many pour out of my hand, that's how many I take. It's usually like six to nine. Um, trace mineral B12, one tablet, and some type of fish oil, either tuna omega, cod liver oil, or the EPDHA, EPA DHA, and that would be two to four pearls. Uh, gymnema, if you're having some blood sugar, you know, still that sweet tooth is hanging in there, two tablets a day, Boswellia complex or turmeric forte, and I would always um, uh, lean to the turmeric forte side, and now they come in a big bottle, so it's awesome. So two tablets of that to uh, support inflammation, uh, for inflammation support, and then the hemp oil complex, two pearls for the endocannabinoid support. And like I said, they just came out with uh, the liquid, so we also have that available. And if you're not sure if, if, if you um, are a candidate for that, just ask us, we can help you with that. So I want you to watch out for this quarantine food. You know, you know think about the, the day 33 of your quarantine when you think you should start calling your meals feedings. You know, so you go grocery shopping and it's not like a hurricane, okay? We, it's like a hurricane that's gone on for four months. And then you have that moment when you've run out of all your good quarantine snacks. You know me, I think I'm funny. Remember, health is a journey and not a destination. So uh, next, um, October, this coming October, we're gonna, I'm gonna call it the October fall call of the quarantine cleanup. And we're gonna do 10 day programs and we'll probably do it Zoom again because it seems a, like a good pathway, although we don't know what's gonna happen. So we'll plan it that. I've already picked some dates out for that. Um, and in January, 2021, you can choose between the 21 day purification program and it's not brand new, but the new detox balance program, it's been in, in, in for about uh, a little over two, a little, just a little less than two years. So if you've not, if you've been successful in the 10 day or you haven't, you know, you haven't done a 21 day, if you've done a 10 day, 21 day is not that hard. So uh, I really encourage you. I always do it in January because it's a great day, great way to kind of set your body straight for the new year. And then use the 10 days. We schedule them in April, July, and October for your when you fall off the wagon or just to maintain your health journey. So I want to thank you for your time. I'm so proud of everybody for uh, making it through the 10 days. It wasn't that hard. And just keep continuing. And, you know, you, you can add some things in, but – um, maybe make a, a, a cheat day once a week. But for the most part, I really would like for you to see to eat less carbohydrates. So try to keep your carbohydrate count for a day under 100. That's just the easy. And just work on that. So watch your, so learn what your carbohydrate measurements are. And you can go on Dr. Google and say, how many grams of carbohydrates are in a medium sized tomato? Or how many grams of carbohydrates are in a Snicker bar? And then you can make your decision. If you're trying to stay under 100 grams of protein, I mean, sorry, carbohydrate today, you're going to stick to vegetables and a little bit of fruit. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. We're so glad and so um, privileged to have you as patients. Uh, Dr. Cooper and I are always privileged to be part of your healthcare team, as well as Tina and Marianne. So thank you. And until October, be well.